the next session before we break for lunch is age of anger the polarization in public discourse to discuss this i invite dr subramanian swami economist and politician mr gurcharan das author commentator and thought leader dr abhinav chandrachud advocate and dr malini patasarthi co person the hindu group they will be in conversation with mini kapoor ideas editor the hindu ladies and gentlemen age of anger the polarization in public discourse is this working i think all our panelists have been introduced and not that any of them need any introduction um we're discussing the age of anger polarization in of public discourse uh in the opening session we heard about the positive aspects of new media whatsapp uh facebook twitter uh to to stay in touch with people these these were people who were leading from exile i think we're going to look at another side of these new media which are facilitating or or triggering a complete polarization where we are living in separate bubbles we 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 talk to people who think like us we follow people who think like us uh we we get together in a big band and attack people who don't think like us and uh, it's uh, the consequences of public discourse is something our panelists will uh will uh, talk about but some of the questions they're going to address is that what is how, uh, are we moving from the politics of aspiration to the politics of grievance everybody's in a state of outrage it's very easy to be outraged about things these days you never know what someone is going to get outraged and <clears throat> we're seeing something new we're seeing grievances being voiced against more helpless against minority communities against uh, uh gender minorities etc against women no uh, so i we will ask malni patasarthi former editor of the hindu to open by talking about for about 5 minutes and then the rest will take take it from there the thing with tanlet my whatever the thing with tanlet and friends uh, thank many for the very sharp i think the dog like thank for the very sharp summation of the crisis that we are facing in our public discourse today I think the rage that is erupting on both extremes of our political life reflects an increasing intellectual crisis, even bankruptcy. That is at the crux of the slow unraveling of our political system. Hence, we have a sense of a strong polarization in public discourse. I, the moral certitude and political conviction of early de earlier decades are fading. a disillusionment is setting in particularly among the younger generation i think it's because of two factors i think it's the first we would have to acknowledge it's a failure of the democratic and liberal section to constantly reimagine and rearticulate key concepts like democracy pluralism and secularism the relevance of these foundational principles to a fast changing social and political context must be established in some there's an undeniable re requirement to ensure that the cultural anxieties and the sense of longing for identity a recognition that is now manifesting has to be addressed these cultural longing while we uphold our core democratic principle what we have unnecessarily done since the beginning of our independent life as an independent nation in our zeal to ensure that our democracy does not become hostile to any particular ident cultural identity we sent i think unnecessarily signals of cultural repression and we have repressed cultural expression we banished it from the public sphere that i think it caused certain distortion we must allow cultural identity and expression to flourish in the private sphere while we rigorously keep a public space 
anchored firmly to citizenship and equality of communities. We must understand secularism as a separation of church and state, allowing for religion and faith in the privacy of our homes, even as we participate in public life only as Indian citizens, regardless of our private cultural identities. I think the emergence of economic reforms, the eagerness to be part of a global market, produced a disenchantment with the earlier socialist view of growth that had held India's economic thinking in thrall for decades. There was a general frustration of a rising and aspirational generation unhappy with the policies that produced low growth rates. All this, I think, manifested in an unfortunate general cynicism and disillusionment with prevailing public values. But in my opinion, the second factor that palpably intensifying the anger in our public sphere is the surge of hate politics and minority bashing sponsored by politicians and parties. This aggressive politics seeks to alter the basic structure of India's civic democracy by diluting the equal citizenship status of religious minorities while privileging the Hindu majority. This type of majoritarian bellicosity draw strength from a combative strategy that makes minority villains build false narratives of victimhood of the majority community. What is regrettable is that we've allowed this extremist brand of hate to represent the right wing of India's democratic political spectrum. I would argue that except, except for a few voices, India lacks a full-fledged right wing ideological perspective, which sharp, we do not have like in the West a sharply distinct articulation of the economy, the nature of political system, national security, or foreign policy. In the West, there's a full-fledged right-wing tradition drawing roots from a respectable conservative history that has carefully structured position on various issues. Significantly, even though conservative parties in the West emphasize hierarchies and social order, they do not draw their life from hatred, bigotry, or chauvinism. But in India, the political forces on the right of our spectrum have been unable to develop a proper worldview that does not draw from bigotry or prejudice. They are unable to gain traction in the political field without a reliance on communal polarization and the invoking of a majoritarian cultural identity. Then why has the consensus on centrist approach to democracy collapsed? I would argue that our centrist and leftist forces are similarly trapped in old ideological cliches and internal battles over obscure formulation. They are unable to recognize the real crisis looming on the horizon, the threat to our self-perception as a nation in the fact that there's a demand to reopen our, the issue of our national identity. Can we as Indians afford to let go of our national pride in being a multicultural liberal democratic republic anchored to basic principles like the rule of law, equality before the law, and freedom of expression and speech. We cannot afford the polarized politics to poison our sense of national unity. We took pride in 1947 in the fact that we would be a multicultural, pluralist democracy, privileging the rights of citizens over the rights of communities. So I think we owe it to ourselves to rebuild public faith in the foundational principles of equality of all citizens, upholding the rule of law, and the freedom of expression and belief. Only then can the idea of India as a vibrant and cohesive democracy continue to have meaning to its millions of citizens. Thank you, Dr. Parthasarthi. I think Dr. Swami will <coughs> address some of the points you've mentioned, in, especially the point of, of the, about the post-47 consensus. It's under very sharp attack today. Uh, one, of course, we worry about the attack, but also there is no sense of what is sought to replace it. Well, I'll, uh, make, I'll make three points. Uh, point one is, uh, during the freedom struggle, they were, we had what is called as the politics of aspersion, aspirations, excuse me. And uh, we imagined what a free India would be and how much better it would be. After 1947 and particularly after 1950, uh, the, the ideology of the Congress which was imposed on the country was essentially left of center. And uh, during Mrs. Gandhi's time, it went a little further. In that uh, occasion, that period, uh, there was uh, two kinds of things which 
in my opinion, receives, it requires attention. One is that anyone who dis, disbelieved or uh, challenged uh, or it brought into public discourse any deviation from the left-wing uh, presentation of what the economy uh, should be or uh, how the uh, world uh, relations, uh, relations with foreign countries should be, uh, were, was isolated and they were subject to a tremendous amount of tribulation. I'm a personal example of that. Uh, I've been denied professorship after being invited to be a professor by left-wing elements in our country. And I'm in politics only because I couldn't teach anywhere in India. I could teach anywhere in the world, but I couldn't teach in India. That was the atmosphere. And at that time, the successful vote strategy of the Congress was divide the Hindu community on caste, religion, uh, on caste, regions, uh, uh, language, etc., and unite the minorities. And that uh, continued for a long time, till the late uh, 80s, and uh, beginning with 90s, the thing began to change, and in 2014, there was first time a reversal. There was consolidation of the Hindu vote, and uh, cutting across caste, regions, languages, etc. And uh, a division began to appear in the minorities, particularly the Muslim community, when, for example, the women who are, represent 50% of the Muslim population, they wanted certain reforms, which they felt that the BJP would be the only party would be able to do it. So now we have a new uh, electoral um, dynamic, and that is consolidation of the Hindus and the division of the minorities, the exact opposite of what was there in the previous uh, years. So that has raised naturally a new question of the, uh, of the what you call as the public discourse. And that will bring my, me to the third point, which is that there is a feeling, uh, and in my opinion it's a very deeply held feeling, may not be articulated, but uh, certainly articulated by people like me, that the Hindu community feels that it has got a raw deal since 1947. And things which ought to get the support of almost everybody, such as uniform civil code, or the integration of Kashmir, or even uh, triple talaq. You would be surprised the number of women organizations in the, amongst uh, the left who had opposed uh, triple talaq as a politically motivated thing. So there, uh, the issue today is that this consolidation continues and uh, then obviously, obviously there will be a challenge uh, to the erstwhile ideology which dominated the country. But uh, no one can go outside the constitution and whatever you may say about hate, about uh, uh, you know, social media, um, uh, hyenas or jackals going after you, whatever, uh, whatever it you may say, these are still subject to all the restrictions that are placed in the constitution. So I think we are now going to a much more healthy situation where the country refres reflects the not only majority but the overwhelming majority and the minorities accommodated on a basis of mutually agreed concept of what this country represents. It's an ancient continuing country which, uh, which uh, mainstream is the Hindu culture and uh, this culture will not, has never been traditionally, whether you can take the example of the Parsis and the Jews, never be against the minorities as long as it's within the mainstream. Thank you. Um, Kurcharan Das is the author, after his corporate life, is the author of many best-selling books, including The Difficulty of Being Good, which he said has gone through more than 10 reprints, he just told us, in the last 12 months uh, alone. The question I wanted to ask you was, uh, one of the consequences, or I, I don't know, it's a chicken and egg thing, is the rise of populism. 
um, it's, it's, it's distorting not just social policies, it's not just distorting the social discourse, it's also distorting economic policy, welfare, economics. Um, how do we react? How, how, how do societies, how do leaderships react to this crisis? Um, <clears throat> that's a good, very, it's a good question. And uh, if I may, Mini, I'll come, let me come back to that. Uh, what I wanted to do was to sort of, to, to tell a few stories, real life stories uh, that have happened to me in the last few years which illustrate this polarization in an age of anger. And <clears throat> let me just begin this, uh, I, I mean I was good enough to bring actually a copy of and difficulty of being good uh, for his wife, for me to sign for his wife. And I was telling him that actually when I first decided to write this book, I decided to go to Chicago where I r r studied Sanskrit. I had studied Sanskrit before, but there were great scholars there. And so I wrote, I, I, I read the Mahabharat. And when I, came, when I was, came back for a short visit to India, I met somebody in a, a very eminent, eminence Greece from one, from one of Indira Gandhi's cabinets. I won't mention the name. And he said, well, what are you writing? And I said, well, I'm writing about a book on the Mahabharat dealing with dharma. And uh, he said, Acha, to tu bhi Hindutva ban gaya. And I said, This is amazing. Just because I'm writing a book on the Mahabharat, this fellow thinks that I've become Hindutva. Something has gone wrong. The Hindutva people have appropriated my <laughs> Mahabharat. And this guy's knee jerk reaction is this. Well, similarly, something similar happened. And I was invited to one of the elite schools of Delhi. I won't mention the name. Uh, and they wanted me to speak to the students at the convocation. And I said, oh good, I've been uh, uh, reading about dharma. And uh, maybe we'll, this will be a good subject to talk about. She said, no, no, please don't mention we are we have got two eminent secular people on our board and you'll get me sacked if you talk about dharma. And I said dharma is, means to do the right thing. Only in the 19th century did dharma have come to mean, uh, also mean religion. So again a bizarre thing happened uh, and, 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 and really I was it's, you know, many countries have a code word which, like a key, opens the secrets of the country. And while for America, it's liberty. They do crazy things like the gun lobby in the name of liberty. France, equally, the code word for France is egalité, equality. And they too have crazy things like the 35-hour week in the name of equality. Now the code word for dharma, the English speaking elite won't realize it, but 98% of India will say it's dharma. Anyway, I was shocked. And finally, let me give a story because Mukund is here. And he was there that day when this thing happened. That there was a book launch of my earlier book in Chennai. And he was uh, there helping with the launch of the book. And, I, and this woman got up and she said to me that, you know, she is being made to feel ashamed of being a Hindu. And so she goes to the temple at night when nobody is looking. And I said again, here's a bizarre, something bizarre that is happening. And finally, before we string these stories together is, a, is the final story that happened a few weeks ago in Delhi at an elite party. Uh, there were diplom diplomats there, women in beautiful saris and in walked a, 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 an unconfident young man who 
nobody knew, but some people later recognized he was an anchor from a Hindi show. But his English was not very com he was not very comfortable with English. And suddenly this the JNU controversy was being Kanaya Kumar controversy was being discussed. And this fellow put up a brave front trying to defend Kanaya Kumar as uh, the, the other side in, in this controversy amongst this very secular cosmopolitan audience. And everybody pounced on him. And you know, I felt I didn't agree with anything that he said. I'm not in favor of sedition or, or nationalism of that kind. But I felt that he had a right to say what he wanted to say. And I felt, you know, after a few minutes, a poor fellow, everybody, he, he was made to feel very small. His English was not very good. And in fact, he uh, quietly left. And, 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 and I felt here, what we were seeing was the intolerance in the name of tolerance. It's the arrogance of the English-speaking secular class. And I think there's a, the, you know, we talk about the different divides of India, the rich and the poor, the low caste, the high caste. But I think there's no bigger divide than the divide between those who speak and think in English and those are in the vernacular. I'm just finishing the story. So the point here is that how do we have a dialogue in this polarized world? That, you know, the chances of such a person to get into a, a good college where he would learn English and be able to imbibe the ideas of conservatism, for example. We, we call him a conservative in the sense of Edmund Burke or Irving Crystal or somebody. I mean, I, if we want to create a true cons intellectual conservative, which we don't have any, then we really must allow such people to go to the universities we go to. The person should get the benefit of get, being able we should be able to communicate with such a person. And maybe the Hindutva that this poor guy will espouse is, will not be based on false empirical grounds, or he won't be talking about the technological fantasies of the Puranas. So therefore, the problem is partly with our secular elite, that it is, and then we complain that, oh, this secular elite is so tiny, it's a minority. And so, frankly, you know, we must remember the liberal ideology is that I, dis I may disagree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that's what I felt that day in that where this fellow was practically humiliated uh, because of his poor knowledge of English, because he was espousing an ideology, we give a bigger chance to the Dalits, to the people with reservations. But people who differ with us, they are a different world. So I just wanted to bring out a different facet of the dilemma that we all face. Yes. I guess we can discuss that after uh, Abhinav makes his intervention. Uh, Abhinav's a lawyer, so I was hoping you would also, you know, in many societies which get politically polarized, there's certain uh, certain professions which serve as the middle ground. It used to be the business community in the earlier days. Uh, now, around the world, business communities speak up less and less about things. It, it's a role that lawyers seem to be playing, the courts and the lawyers, they, they're directing conversations in particular directions where people join in. So, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like a shared space. So, you know, let me um, answer that question by uh, telling you all the story. Uh, when the British came to India, they found that they were faced with a very serious problem. Uh, it was a problem to them, which is how do you deal with witnesses in courts of law who don't subscribe to the religious practice that you consider is the correct religious practice. Because in, in England, there was an established religion. In fact, people who took office, people who swore oaths uh, in courts, 
uh, they had to actually take an oath which was a religious oath. Uh, in England, for the, for the longest time, you had to swear that you didn't believe in the theory, the Catholic theory of transubstantiation. So when they came to India, they were confronted with Hindu witnesses and Muslim witnesses. So what do you do with them? So they decided to introduce the Quaker oath in India and they made Hindu witnesses solemnly affirm. So you didn't have to swear in the name of God. You could just solemnly affirm that what you were going to say was the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now what happens is that when the constitution was being enacted in 1950, a question arose when your ministers, when your Supreme Court judges and High Court judges and officials are going to be taking office, are you going to be making them take the same Quaker oath? Are you going to be making them take the solemn affirmation? Or are you going to be make, uh, asking them to take a, an oath in the name of God? And a great debate ensued among the framers of our constitution. And eventually it was decided that first, there will be two options that will be open to any person who wants to take an oath of office. The first option will be that you swear in the name of God. And not any particular God, not in the name of Vishnu, not in the name of Allah, but in the name of a God. And that is on top of the line, and then a line is drawn beneath God, and then there, is, there are the words solemn, solemnly affirm. So you have the option as a public official to either take the oath in the name of God, which is the preference according to the framers of the constitution, or you can solemnly affirm. So I guess the point that the framers of our constitution were trying to drive home about our system was that secularism in India, as originally conceived, did not mean the absence of religion in the public sphere. It did not mean that our public officials were not entitled to hold religious beliefs. It simply meant that you could not impose any particular religious dogma, religious practice on the people. You could, of course, hold your own solemn beliefs, but you could not impose them on the populace. Um, coming back to the question that you asked me, many about, you know, well, the topic of today's uh, discussion is the age of anger. I'm not really convinced that we're living in an age of anger. I mean, after all, we're a country that has seen partition-related rioting where, you know, people killed in the name of religion. That was the age of anger. I would say today we've gone from an age of anger to an age of grievance. Um, you know, last year, Mini told me that, you know, we had a panel uh, on the huddle, uh, which was called the Republic of Hurt Sentiments. And I think that we are a, a republic, a country where, you know, our sentiments are hurt too easily. And the problem that has now taken place is that in the digital world, in, di in the digital India, uh, it's so easy for, let's say, something that's published online in Mumbai, uh, to be, uh, for someone to take offense against it in the remotest district of Jharkhand or Bihar. And a criminal case can then be uh, of defamation or of, uh, you know, a contempt of court or of sedition can be filed against you. Or if, and, and criminal defamation is still an offense despite the, uh, the efforts of a very eminent member of our panel today. Um, so I feel that perhaps it's also, a, a, you know, uh, the time that we think, start thinking about reforming the system. You know, the, I've, I've spoken about this before in terms of sedition, you know, contempt of court. Um, there are so many things we can do. Contempt of court, uh, I feel that if we, you know, kind of make it, make only contempts that are punishable in the face of the court, some, when you offend the judge on his face, of course, that should be punishable. But if I make a statement on Twitter, I doubt that that should be something that uh, should be considered contempt of court. Um, so maybe we can start thinking about reform. I mean, uh, one last example I'll give you and then I'll leave it at that and then we can have a discussion. You know, there's a very popular viral song that's, uh, uh, that's taken hold in our country about this high school girl and high school boy who are, you know, making, uh, you know, well, they're winking at each other. And there's a song that plays in the background and now someone has taken offense that that song is played at very holy and somber occasions or, or, or that's what's happened in the past. And a criminal case, I'm informed, has been filed in Hyderabad. So I feel that perhaps we, you know, as a, as a country get offended a little too easily. And the problem is that the, our laws and our system uh, kind of help these people who get hurt too easily to kind of then use the law against, uh, you know, honest, hardworking uh, artists and, you know, uh, actors and politicians. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Parthasarthi. Oh, but in an age of very polarized discourse where the polit our political parties, our politicians, are, they, they have their ear too much to what is the mood of the moment, even if that moment is not going to last beyond a day or two weeks, etc. Where is this consensus on reform? Where is the argument about reform? Where is the debate on reform going to come from? Um, which is the sphere in which I this think, consensus um, will be built? 
So I think that if we can really bring the whole consensus back to, you know, basic principles like need to establish equality before the law, the um, basic democratic principle, might be easier to get a conversation more emboldened into, you know, tackling issues like reform. And, you know, especially what you say about Muslim personal law and even looking at the civil code. But if the very idea of India is under challenge, I think when so much insecurity being fueled deliberately by majority in Hindutva, this is not the right time to even put things forward because we are not, uh, as a nation, even settled on what to be the fundamental consensus on how we need to take our democracy forward. Dr. Swami, how do we build a consensus on just the basic principles we can all agree on and then, then discuss our differences yeah. within them? Well, you uh, spoke about uh, uh, the, in the title, public, uh, what was it? The, uh, uh, the uh, polarization. The polarization, yeah. Now, you see, the question is today, as I see, this uh, society is divided into the Hindutva crowd, which doesn't want to talk to the left, and the left doesn't want to give any opportunity for Hindutva people to explain. The Hindu newspaper, for example, they publish uh, my articles on the economy, on China, everything. But when I told Malini, will you publish uh, my article on what Hindutva really represents, she says, no, I will not publish. <laughs> May I answer? I was explaining that Article 19.2 that does have the concept of restrictions when it affects national unity. So when hate policy so, comes into the picture, there you are. That it, it affects. <laughs> so how can I have a debate when she becomes uh, the editor becomes judgmental? <laughs> I've already been judged. So. I would say, first of all, both the Hindu crowd and the left-wing crowd has to accept the Constitution. The interpretation of the Constitution is the question that we can talk about, how much is permitted or not. Now, for example, the banning of slaughter of cows is there in the Constitution. The promotion of Sanskrit is there in the Constitution in Article 351 and the Devanagari script being used for Hindi and no other script is also there in the Constitution. So, Uniform Civil Code, which people think is a Hindutva stand, is also there in the Constitution. So, I would say, if you take the Constitution as the base and nobody can deviate from that, and if there is something which has gone too far, maybe we can go to the courts and try an amendment. I did. The, as it is pointed out, I tried very hard to remove criminal defamation. Nobody should go to jail for what he says. Uh, and I must say, uh, in terms of judgment, one of the finest judgments I've read on this question, the boundary of free speech, is uh, Justice Nariman's uh, on this uh, uh, Information Technology Act, uh, section of 66, uh, Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India, where the boundaries are defined. You can't, under the Constitution, ask for secession of a part of India. That's, there, uh, that's subject to reasonable restriction. You can't say a certain part of practice in religion is my right. I have a fundamental right to preach what I want. No, there is, in the Constitution's three clear restrictions. Any religious practice or preaching which violates public order, which creates public disorder, or it's against morality, or it's against uh, health. These are something which the state can amend. And it is on that basis that we amended the Sharia and said the triple talaq is not allowed. So I think the first thing that needs to be done is Hindu should open its uh, pages to Hindutva people writing articles, and you can rebut them. And let there be a public debate, let others contribute. That's the way to come to a, some kind of accommodation. I guess. <laughs> it, you know, Minnie, I wanted to I, actually... Uh, I just wanted to add a question to that. Sure, which I hope sure, we'll go ahead. Take, uh, you know, a lot of these things are in the Constitution. Uh, we're not... Uh, 
it's because we're discussing about polarization. It's it's a very odd situation where we have a polarized public discourse, but there are there is it's amidst fear. There are certain sections of the country yeah. who, who, who feel fearful. Why is this happening? How is this happening? What is the rhetoric with which it's yeah. being made to happen? So, how yeah. there is a time well, and a manner. But I, I, I wanted to actually take over from uh, what Dr. Swami just said. That <clears throat> really, you're right. It's in the constitution, and what is in the constitution, but. The most inspiring example that I know and something that we should aspire to one day as a society is the judgment that was given in the Illinois Supreme Court in the 1970s at the death anniversary of Hitler. The neo-Nazis wanted to march in a Jewish neighborhood 89% were Jews and they were Holocaust survivors and the neo-Nazis wanted to march shouting Heil Hitler with swastikas and this went to the Supreme Court because the Jews wanted to stop it. They said this will offend politics of grievance. This will offend us. And you know what the judge finally decided? He said to the Jews if if shouting Heil Hitler is going to offend you, close your ears. If, if seeing the swastika is going to offend you, close your windows. But free speech will prevail unless there is a danger to someone's life. Now I think, frankly, this is going much further than our constitution does or we do. But I think this is one day we should reach to this level of maturity where we can say that, look, I, you, you can say what the judge said. And I, I just want to quickly <coughs> disagree with this fine young man here on my left, uh, Abhinav, that, you know, he says, well, I mean, this is not an age of anger. Well, I mean, everyone is angry in India today. The secularists are angry that a man with the stain of Gujarat 2002 is their prime minister and is as popular as ever without an alternative in sight. The, ga the Gaurakshaks are... Why are you looking at me? Gaurakshaks, <laughs> the Gaurakshaks are upset because their man the Prime Minister calls them criminals. Muslims are angry because they don't want to live in a Hindu Rashtra. They're feeling insecure. The ordinary Hindu is angry because he's made to feel ashamed of his religion by the intellectual class. Dalits are insecure because of the upper class, upper caste attitude of the BJP. The jobless are angry because Achedin have not arrived as yet. The left intellectuals are angry because, well, they've been angry since the fall of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, now they're losing all their privileges in the university seats that you were after. And the middle class is angry or rather envious because East and Southeast Asia and more recently China have gone, have, have left India far behind. And finally, the vernacular speaking Indian, the vast majority resent the English speaking elite for cornering the fruits of modernity. This divide in language for me is the most tragic one of all because it makes a person who's not fluent in English feel like a second-rate citizen in his own country. So we have a lot of anger. I'm going to uh, ask actually Abhinav to address uh, <laughs> well your disagreement with him. But more than that, I think if Abhinav can, uh, can sort of Give us his thoughts. Um. Sure. So, you know, that was a great example about the Illinois Supreme Court. Yeah. But another example comes to mind. 
which is the university that I studied at uh, Harvard. Um, so I wish they had followed the example of the Illinois Supreme Court because a very eminent professor from India was supposed to go and teach at Harvard University. And uh, he had a certain point of view. I may not agree with that point of view. He's here on the panel today. And he wasn't allowed to speak at Harvard University. And as someone who studied at Harvard, I feel that it's, it's so appalling because you want to create spaces where you have different points of view and then you can decide for yourself whether you agree with that point of view or not. But if you're going to isolate yourself and only going to listen to the points of view that you want to listen to, then the entire objective of a free dialogue is lost. So what's the point of having a First Amendment if you're not going to listen to different points of view? Um, coming back to the... Coming back to the, uh, the judgment of Justice Nariman, I think that, you know, that sort of articulates what the Illinois Supreme Court said as well. Justice Nariman has drawn this distinction between advocacy and incitement. And he said that, look, there's a, there's a line between just advocating a point of view and inciting violence. So on the pages of the Hindu, if somebody wants to simply advocate a certain perspective about Hindutva or about what the country should be doing, um, that's not really inciting violence. So, so long as you don't incite violence, even our constitution, according to Justice Nariman, allows you simply to articulate a certain point of view. Uh, if I can just say one thing more, it's the, the problem really is that most of the laws that deal with free speech in this country are criminal laws, laws like sedition and so on. And the problem there is that then the enforcement of those laws is in the hands of the police. And as somebody who practices criminal law part-time, I can tell you that the police have a reputation of being notoriously corrupt. Now take everything I tell you with a pinch of salt because I'm obviously on the defense side. So the stories that I'll tell you are all stories from uh, you know, people who are aggrieved by the police. But the police from where I come from follow a very interesting uh, uh, strategy. Uh, in criminal law, it's well known that it's better to let 10 guilty men go free than send one innocent man to jail. But if somebody is accused of a crime, what the police do is they immediately bring him to the station and they thrash him or they thrash whoever is suspected of the crime until somebody confesses and then they eventually file a case against him. So the, the policy that's followed by our police is we'll thrash 10 innocent people in order to find the one guilty person, if at all. So if you're going to leave the enforcement of the criminal law to people of that nature, then really we're in some serious trouble. And that's why I think it's time for us to start reforming some of the criminal laws in this country simply because the people who are executing the criminal law may not be necessarily the best uh, you know, of, of institutions. I'm of course not, now not speaking about the high courts and supreme court. I'm speaking about the police and the constabulary. I just have one question for both Dr. Swami and Mr. Das. I mean, everyone appreciates freedom of expression, free speech, the right to offend, and so on. But how do you make sure it doesn't degenerate into hate speech and communal campaigns and in bigotry and chauvinism? And it's, you know, who, who is saying all this? I mean, you know, when there's bigotry being expressed at higher levels, it, yeah. isn't it more dangerous? Yeah, I mean, I said I'm against the law on sedition. And I'm also against, the, uh, I also distinguish between good and bad nationalism. The best distinction was made by George Orwell at the end of the first, Second World War, when he said that, look, both good nationalists and bad nationalists love their country. The difference is the good nationalists are the, are the bad nationalists are concerned with power, the power of their country, that we are superior to others, and that creates a divide within society. The good nationalist remembers the growing up in the country, the geography, the history of the country, and even wonders why his loyalty should stop at the border. Why can't it continue? as Tagore said, beyond your border, you know? And, and so I, f I personally feel that as far as speech is concerned, we really, it's, it's really, it's, it's really the Illinois judgment, finally, that should inspire us. Um, we have about well, eight minutes. Well, so you say, uh, let me just briefly deal with what she said. She, Malini said that uh, what happens if 
a publication is to be made which is openly inciting something. Well, in my case, you didn't even see the article, so, <laughs> so you couldn't have come to the conclusion that I was going to incite. But free speech becoming degenerated into hate speech. No, no, that's in the public that is not about the article. The issue is this only, that everything, there is a provision in the constitution. It's not possible for anybody to make a speech where he openly incites somebody to violence. There's a lot of dog whistle politics. Huh? Which, there's a lot of dog whistle politics which… Uh, which politics? Dog whistle, where you sort of imply things which actually is much more menacing than saying something hateful right there. You may, you may say anything but if it doesn't lead to… this is why I say the Shreya's single uh, judgment is worth reading. Unless, you see, for instance, if I were to stand in a cinema hall which is uh, where people are seeing the cinema and I get up and say, fire, and there will be a stampede, people will die. That's actually, you should see the proximate relationship between what you say and the outcome in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tragic way. So, unless you say something, which is something which is uh, clearly has incited people, to, uh, to, uh, to go to, into an open action and, and you can't make it ridiculous. For instance, once I wrote a book on how to fight Islamic terror and somebody uh, filed, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, he, and I'm going to teach him a lesson for that, uh, <laughs> uh, he filed, uh, he had a case filed against me for, for hate speech and the only evidence the police could produce in the court was that six letters to the editor were written opposing my book. Now, that cannot be incitement. Of course, the case was dismissed, so it's okay. But the fact of the matter is that you should have a rational attitude to somebody. You just don't listen to him. Uh, but if something leads to a violence or an incitement, then of course I think one, uh, one has to uh, use the law and the law exists for treating it. I think we could have gone on, but we have about five minutes for questions. Um, Mr. Ram? The law of criminal defamation in India, and nobody has pushed it to the limits, as far as I know, as uh, Dr. Swami has done, and he's also challenged it. Now, the Supreme Court's judgment in 2016, the two-member uh, bench, including the present Chief Justice and uh, Justice Pan, was disappointing and, from our standpoint, deplorable. It took things back because as early as 2003, we had challenged the law of criminal defamation, Ravi being the petitioner of the Supreme Court, but the case uh, was withdrawn, so there was no cause. Do you see a time, then maybe Dr. Swami also can say, when we can really have this refer to a constitution bench and get the kind of judgment that we got on the law of privacy? Because this is a shame. Sri Lanka has abolished the law of criminal defamation, but India, it continues to be a real problem for the press and also for politicians and others. Dr. Swami, in the company, in the unusual company of Rahul Gandhi and uh, uh, and Harvind Kejriwal challenged it and, uh, you know, that's quite something but, and, and failed. Uh, but is there any hope that this can be struck down because it's, it's, it's terrible? Uh, just a clarification, I filed the petition, Rahul Gandhi and Kejriwal impleted themselves with it. They didn't do any original work. <laughs> but, but you built your arguments on uh, Ravi's petition. Yes, Ravi's petition was uh, where the court was very favorable. But uh, anyway, he's uh, the expert and uh, he's the lawyer here. But uh, I would say this much that we have to wait till the new Chief Justice takes over before we can go back. <laughs> because the same person is the, still the Chief Justice. 
So I won't really um, say anything about whether a constitution bench can be constituted or not, but I certainly think that what's stopping our legislators, I mean, after all, in England, when criminal defamation was abolished, along with other kinds of libels, uh, it was not done by the courts, which don't have the power of judicial review in the first place. It was the political process that did away with it. I don't see why there can't be unanimity of the political spectrum on this point, because politicians across all political parties are being harassed for criminal defamation. But I would say even if you want to take a step back, even if you don't want to entirely abolish criminal defamation, you can reform it. So for example, you know, under the law of criminal defamation, it was the uh, Indian Penal Code which was originally drafted by Thomas Babington Macaulay, who had a very patronizing view about, uh, you know, uh, about India and he thought that, you know, all the literature of uh, India was not worth one good shelf of books of, uh, written in English. So Macaulay actually thought that truth should be made an absolute defense to criminal defamation. And despite that, truth is only a qualified defense to criminal defamation. So it's only if you can show that what you have said was not merely true, but it was also in the public interest that you can then defend yourself and, and get off on criminal defamation. Not merely that, I've been, uh, I've been quoted as having said that advocates should be entirely exempt from criminal defamation. I never said that. What I said was that in England, for example, a statement that's made by an advocate or a witness in court on inst uh, the advocate on instructions is considered absolutely exempt. You have absolute privilege. Whereas in India, as an advocate, if I make a statement, let's say I'm fighting a case against somebody, and you know we have an example today where a prominent criminal lawyer was cross-examining a politician, and he was asked, are you asking these questions on instructions, or are you making them yourself? Well, the advocate could have been sued for criminal defamation for something that he said in court. And I feel that really in our courtrooms, as in parliament, if we can't in, uh, encourage the highest free speech, how are you going to arrive at the truth? So I don't think advocates and witnesses should be afraid that they'll be sued for criminal defamation. Uh, so at least there are some ways we can reform it, though I entirely agree that the, uh, the law of criminal defamation needs to go. And well, we can also think about reforming civil defamation. By the way, uh, the uh, Babington uh, Macaulay's home country, Britain, in 2013 has abolished criminal defamation. It's only yeah. India which is holding the British tradition. I think even Kenya last year abolished yeah, it. The same afternoon. arguments from the petitioners, but they abolished it. Yeah, very good afternoon. Uh, here. Fez, very much. I have got on mic here. Yeah, it's my question yeah. to Mr. Abhinav. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything now law, uh, implicable on whatever the posting done on a WhatsApp group or circular? Anything? Can you just share it? Sorry. Uh, could uh, you now, repeat the question, please? Is anything now law applicable, whatever the posting or circulated on WhatsApp group? Yeah, thank you. Is the law uh, which applies to anything said in public, does it apply to WhatsApp groups? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, uh, the law of defamation is that if, what is publication in defamation? Publication means to say something to anything, to, any, to anybody except the person to whom the letter is addressed. So, if I li write a private letter to you and I say defamatory things about you, that's not considered defamation. But if I write a letter to you and I mark it to the Prime Minister of India, then you've been defamed. So if I even send that letter to one other person, it's considered defamation, it's considered publication. So if you say something on WhatsApp and there are two people on that group, you could be sued for defamation. And all the laws of, uh, against free speech, the law of sedition and everything else applies with great gusto and great force to all the digital platforms, including Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp as well. I think we can take one more question. Yeah. See, my question is to Dr. Swami. Dr. Swami wants the freedom to write articles in the Hindu, of course, other papers, and he, he spoke about the Constitution of India. But then when he began his speech, he, he spoke against the Constitution in, in talking of India in terms of the Hindu culture alone, whereas in, in India has enriched with several cultures apart from the Hindu culture. And also, Mr. S Dr. Swami has also written articles in, in the Indian Express, the New Indian Express, where he said Muslims must be disenfranchised. So, does that come under the constitution of India? Can such articles be allowed to be published? And of course, I countered in, yeah. in the Indian Express. Well, I think uh, you have uh, embellished what I said. First of all, I have never posed the constitution anywhere. Uh, I have never said that this constitution should be uh, made into a Hindu Rashtra constitution. In fact, I have dissuaded the Vishwanthu Parishad from demanding that. Uh, by saying that whatever we want in Hindu Rashtra is already there in the constitution, you don't need a, uh, to have a, a new constitution for that. As far as the uh, disenfranchisement of Muslims, 
what I advocated, I can tell you, that those Muslims who do not acknowledge what modern science says today, namely their DNA is the same as the DNA of the Indian Hindus, those uh, Muslims should acknowledge it. If they don't, then the purpose of partition f has failed and the division on the basis of Hindu and Muslim, which the British did, has failed and therefore for them now to say that whether they, uh, I think they this live is in India. opening up a completely yeah, okay. different debate from the question. The constitution does not bar somebody saying that my ancestors were, are Hindus. Okay, there's nothing in the constitution that bars it. If, uh, if, as I told you, it was an advocacy. If someone doesn't like it, they can always uh, go and challenge it in court and get it struck down. I think given free speech, we can discuss this forever. Yeah, yeah. I have different points of view, but I'm very, way out of time. One so very quick question, if you will allow that here. Where is this? Right here. So my question is to Dr. Swami. Uh, judging only by your television performances, sir, and I may be unfair, you come across as perpetually angry. So to play with the name of a Said Mirza movie, Subramanian Swami ko gussa kyu aata hai? And very briefly, this afternoon, why do you need gun-toting security guards to protect you from us? Because we in the audience today are only armed with pencils and water bottles. That's right. I think one line answers to both. One line answer to the second question, it is actually given to protect you from me. <laughs> And the decision was not made by me, it was made by the government, not this government, but or right from Narsimha Rao's period. Uh, you know that very well, once you came and argued with Narsimha Rao, that this should be withdrawn. Uh, uh, so, therefore, uh, as far as my anger, most people think that I smile too much. Uh, I have not seen, uh, it's very difficult to make me angry. So, I don't know why you got that impression, but maybe, uh, I'll take care next time up here and think of you. <laughs> Thank you to the panel. That was, I think, we could have gone on forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian Swami, Mr. Gurcharan Das, Dr. Abhinav Chandrachud, Ms. Dr. Malni Parthasarthi, and Mini Kapoor. I request. Mini Kapoor to present mementos to our guests as a token of our appreciation. This is the print of the first editorial of the Hindu.